What would you do if your child was bullied to the point where they decided they weren't worth living and so they committed suicide? In an instant, all of your hopes and dreams for your child were gone. Could you have done something? Now what would you do? Welcome to Justice Counts, the podcast that goes beyond the law to what's important to you. Equal justice for all is a guidepost for our nation, but how do we achieve that? Here are your hosts, writer-commentator Bob Gaddy and novelist attorney Mark M. Bello. Kirk and Laura Smalley lost their son, Richard Ty Field Smalley, in 2010 in the aftermath of a bullying episode. Since then, Kirk and Laura worked tirelessly to prevent other families from suffering the same pain and loss. They've traveled all across the United States and visited several other countries, spreading the message of love and support to children who need it. Even meeting with President Barack Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama to talk about what can be done to ensure our children grow up safe and whole. In 2020, Laura Smalley's journey ended. After suffering a brain aneurysm, she finished her fight and has been reunited with her beloved son. Kirk knows they are still with him, giving him the strength he needs to continue on with his mission. That mission is simple, to give our children a safe future where each one can grow into the amazing individuals they are meant to be. Kirk Smalley, welcome. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate you having me on. This is Mark. Welcome. First of all, our sympathies for the loss of your son, which is extremely preventable, and the loss of your wife. Bad things happen to lots of people, but not everyone can advocate for a cause following such a tragedy. Not everyone can take a negative like the sense of death of a child and turn it into a cause for good. Bob and I applaud you, sir. I presume you didn't have a background in public speaking or advocacy. What made you different than other parents who have experienced tragedy? Why did you decide to start Stand for the Silent? Mark, after Laura and I lost Ty, we did a little research and we found out how prevalent suicide because of being bullied was in our society now. Most people don't realize the impact that bullying has on kids and the amount of children that we're losing on a daily basis to suicide because of bullying. I actually have a list of over 66,000 children that we've lost in the United States in the last seven years, which if you do a little math, that comes out to almost 23 a day, almost a child an hour just to suicide due to bullying. And we just decided that we couldn't live in a world like that. We didn't want another mom, another dad to feel the pain and live the nightmare that we lived every single day with our baby without doing everything that we could to make it stop. It's just hard to imagine what you guys went through. And I joined Mark in applauding you for the work that you're doing. Can you explain to us a little bit about what some of the aspects of bullying are, especially when it comes to bullying in school? Sure. There is a actual definition of bullying. It's an aggressive and repeated behavior among school-aged children that usually involves a real or a perceived imbalance of power. The victims of bullying and the bullies themselves can, and a lot of them do, have very lasting problems later on in life. A bully may use his imbalance of power, such as physical strength, bigger, stronger, faster, social status. My parents are richer. They may have access to embarrassing information, things like pictures that they've taken in a locker room or in a classroom or bathroom. But again, bullying is a repetitive behavior. It's it's something that, that is repeated over a period of time. Well, it doesn't have to be physical, right? It can be hurtful words. It can be teasing. It can be excluding someone from a group, embarrassing a kid, as you indicated with pictures in front of a 
in front of his or her peers. This can be direct or indirect, in person or electronic. Cyberbullying is a big thing these days, right? Yes, sir. Cyberbullying has actually increased over 75% since the, the pandemic began. It's grown to the extent that we actually launched a new website. It is still stand for the silent R organization, but we have a standalone website for it. It's called socialbullets.org. And on there, we actually did a campaign with a large ad agency called Area 23, and they created an algorithm that tracked cyberbullying over all the social media websites for a 24-hour period. And every time, every 238 times a child was cyberbullied, one of them tried to take their own life. And they created four different posters depicting four different types of cyberbullying. And every time that number over that 24-hour period hit that 238 number, they fired a live bullet at one of those posters at a, a closed shooting range. And they had a group of high school kids and their parents watching this experiment. And they caught their reactions and they interviewed with them. And that video is available on that website. There is also a downloadable guide for parents on how to combat cyberbullying. They can download it for free. And we are currently working on a peer-to-peer -peer guide because we've learned that kids learn from kids quicker than they learn from adults. And we hope to have that peer-to-peer -peer guide. If we're in the process of doing interviews with a bunch of teens right now that have been cyber bullied and have been cyber bullies and we're finding out how they came out on the other side of it and what steps they took, how they dealt with it. And, and we hope to have that peer to peer guide up on that website shortly. Cyber bullied and cyber bullies. Do both groups feel similar impacts? Is there like a guilt syndrome on the cyber bullying side as opposed to a helplessness feeling on the cyber bullied side? What is the effect to a cyber bully? You know, really, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> that the reason that, that a lot of kids cyber bully is because it's so easy. They can remain anonymous. Our kids are so good with technology now, Mark. I've been to schools and spoken and done presentations where first graders have smartphones and they're good on them. They know how to use them. And kids can take a picture of somebody in the locker room or in the bathroom or in the hallway. They can use Photoshop and make it look like that kid's doing whatever they want them to be doing. They can create a fake Facebook account. They can post that picture online and ruin someone's life with the click of a button. Even if they get to feeling bad about that and think, maybe I shouldn't have done that. I'll remove that post. I'll take that picture down. It's not gone. It's out there forever. Someone's seen it. Someone shared it. Someone saved it. It stays out in cyberland forever. Where and when do most bullying occurrences take place? Bullying happens literally everywhere. It happens during school hours. It happens after school. It happens on playgrounds, in the hallways, in the classrooms, in the buses. It happens obviously online and sadly, Bob, it happens in our homes. I think that's where most of these kids learn that type of behavior. Bullying is a learned thing. We are not born to hate. Hatred is something that we learn and we learn it from the people that we're around most often. I've done several dozens of presentations for the Native American culture. I'm based out of Oklahoma and we have a lot of Native American reservations. I've been to Washington state and spoken several times at reservations up there even. And I have learned one thing about the Native American culture and bullying. We have what's called a generational bullying where grandma and grandpa bullied this certain family and mom and dad bullied that same family. And then They've taught their kids that they bully that same family. And if we can break that cycle for one generation, one, one child, you think of how many different lives we can affect down through the course of history with that. That's amazing. Stand for the silent. First of all, where'd the name come from? And 
if I'm understanding it correctly, it's a, it's a bullying awareness site and a bullying prevention site. And on the site, you ask this question, what is the number one strategy teachers can use to eradicate bullying in their classroom? But before we get to that, is there a number one strategy? If, if so, would you share it? And perhaps other strategies that might be effective for teachers and for parents? Sure. To answer your first question, where did the name Stand for the Silent came from? Stand for the Silent was actually started by a group of high school kids from Oklahoma City when they heard about what happened to our son, Ty, and they decided that they didn't want to live in a world like that anymore without them, them doing whatever they could to keep it from happening to another child. And so they created a face page called Stand for the Silent, and we heard about what they were doing and we reached out to their director and we went and had a discussion with these kids. There were 68 of them. And over the course of that discussion, we decided that we didn't have just their hallways and their schools to make changes in, that, that we had to change the, the entire world. And so we worked with them. They donated their graphics, their Facebook page a constitution that they had written up, a pledge that they had written, all of that stuff to Laura and I, and we incorporated and we became a nonprofit and we started visiting schools. How, how old were these kids? They were high school kids. Good. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, in answer to your second question, the number one strategy that, that we ask about, the best thing that schools and teachers can do is keep this in front of the kids on a daily basis. It's something, you know, it, it's like herding cats, literally. It's something that kids have to have in front of them every single day. There are 10 different items on our website that schools can do to help curb bullying and prevent bullying in their school and in their hallways. And the first one would be to establish school-wide policies and classroom procedures pertaining to bullying that are not only given to the teachers, but also to students and parents. Know that bullying policy should be in every student handbook in every school in our nation. Step two would be to help keep it in front of the kids would be posters in the hallways, in the lunchrooms, in the gymnasiums. We have pledge posters available on our website that, that speak about respecting yourself and respecting others. We have pledge cards that we will give to every school that asks for them in any quantity they want, that the kids sign and they date and they keep them to remind them of the promise that they're making. Step three would be to develop strategies to recognize and reward positive social behavior. When a kid stands up for another child, that kid ought to be recognized for that. That takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of guts for a kid to stand up and say, hey, leave him alone. There are more bystanders than there are bullies, and there are more bystanders there are, than there are victims of bullying. And if we can get one of those bystanders to stand up and say, hey, stop, it's a proven fact that 96% of the time bullying stops within 10 seconds if someone will speak up against it. That doesn't mean that the same child's not going to be bullied again tomorrow by the same individual, but it stops now within 10 seconds, 96 percent of the time, if we can get a bystander to speak up. The fourth step would be to have a discussion with all of the people involved in that bullying situation. And you do that separately, talk with the bully and then talk with the victim. And then you do it together and then bring in the parents of each and have that discussion. It's important. A lot of parents don't realize that their child is being that way that they're being a bully. All of us want to believe that our child's an angel. Oh, Timmy would never do such a thing. He's an angel. But Timmy just told Sally on Facebook that she's worthless and that she ought to go kill herself. And when their parents see that with their own eyes, they can't help get involved. One of the things that we, one of the resources that we leave at every school and every community that we go to are resources for parents to help combat cyberbullying on social media. If your child is on social media, you should be on their friends list. If your kid's on Facebook, 
you better be on Facebook and be their friend on Facebook because you need to know what's going on on social media with your kids nowadays. Some of the resources that we leave, we there's an app called Bark, and they have it for families, and they also have it for schools. And if you look, it's free forever for schools K through 12. And what they do is they monitor your child's social media presence, and they send a message to mom and dad if your kid's being bullied on Facebook or Instagram or something like that. Not only do they do that, they also send a message to mom and dad if your kid's being a bully. And it, that's a great way to help protect your kids online. There's several others. There's one called TeenSafe. There's one called My Social Sit. Bark covers more of the the social media platforms. So all of those are ways that schools and kids can or parents can get involved to help protect their kids from bullying. Step five would be to develop different individual intervention plans for children who are bullied and children who participate as bystanders. Bullying doesn't occur if the bully doesn't have an audience. They have to have somebody to play to. They have to have somebody to see that I'm bigger, I'm stronger, I'm faster, I'm smarter, whatever. Those intervention plans may need to include steps to address circumstances where a child has been bullied, also bullies others, because I have what I call my kick the dog theory, Mark. I'm bullied at work by my boss, and I go home, and I take it out on the wife. And the kid walks outside, and he kicks the dog, because that's the only one lower than him on that food chain that he has to pass that pain down. So a lot of kids that are being bullied turn into bullies because they think that's the way that they can get rid of their pain by passing it to someone else. But you know what? It doesn't work that way. It doesn't make you feel better about yourself. Step six would be mindful. Be aware of class seating arrangements. Don't sit a kid that's being bullied by another child side by side or where they can, you know, have access to each other. That's a really bad move. Hold periodic class meetings and presentations to discuss positive role models, not bullying, that kind of thing. Contact parents. You got to let parents know once again, your child is performing unacceptable behavior. A lot of times parents don't know what's going on and they can't help if they can't tell. Now, granted, some parents don't care. Some parents are bullies and that's where these kids can learn that behavior, but they still can't fix it if they don't know that there's a problem. And then documenting bullying, that, that's very important. There should be a running record every time a child is reported to be bullied, not only in the victim of bullying's student profile, but in the bully's uh, paperwork. They, there should always be documentation. That was one of the things that really hurt Laura and I. Laura worked at the school that Ty went to, and Ty was being bullied for almost two years by this group of kids, mainly one ringleader. He was bullied because he was the smallest kid in his class. He was in sixth grade, and he was about the size of a fourth grader, and they picked on him relentlessly over that. And being an employee of the school, Laura was in the office almost every day reporting that, hey, you need to have this kid leave Ty alone. He's being picked on again. He got chocolate milk dumped on him in the lunchroom. They stole his backpack. They pushed him on the playground. They, they, you know, all of this. After Ty took his own life, we requested all of his items. I guess you could say we wanted everything that had to do with our son from that school. Anything that was out of his locker, we didn't care if it was what they considered trash, a piece of paper that was scribbled on. We, we wanted anything to do with our boy. It was what was left. And we wanted all of his school records as well. In his school records, there was not one single piece of documentation that showed that Laura had ever one time gone into the school office and spoken to him about him being bullied. Not one single item 
documentation that she had ever complained. And she was in there almost daily for two years. And so documenting that is very important. And if the school doesn't do it, parents should write and keep a journal. I went to the office. This is who I spoke to. This is the time I spoke to them. I called. This is the time of the phone call. This is the date of the phone call. This is what they told me. Document everything. The last step would be possibly assign students classroom buddies and periodically change those buddies so that everybody has a, a chance to get to know each and every one of their classmates. A lot of schools, especially elementary schools, have what they call buddy benches out on their playground. And from what I've seen, those are working wonderful. And what a buddy bench is, is they have a certain little bench out on the playground. And if a child doesn't have someone to play with, maybe he's a new kid in school and he doesn't know anyone, doesn't have any friends yet, they can go and sit on that bench. And when someone sees that there's someone sitting on that bench, their mission is to go over and say, hey, come play with us. Come join our team that type of thing. And things like that seem to work really good, especially in the lower grade levels. I'm curious, you just mentioned 10 different strategies. You've traveled all over the country, perhaps in, in different parts of the world. What percentage of schools have implemented these 10 steps or anything close to these 10 steps? I see a lot of schools that start implementing them after I have been there. And I sit down and I speak with either the principal or the school counselor, whoever invites me to the school. We will literally go to any school that invites us without charge. I have been literally all over the world. We've done presentations in Australia, the Cayman Islands, Puerto Rico. We have chapters in 18 different countries and 40 states now. I have done 6,022 in-person presentations and countless Zoom presentations for schools that I don't even keep track of anymore. I have talked to a little over 4 million kids. We get these schools to get involved. We ask that they start a chapter of Stanford Asylum to help keep our message alive. We put them in touch with our national chapter liaisons when they do start their chapter who send them resources. We don't want to be a one and done organization. We want to help them continue this messaging and not only keep it in their hallways and change the culture and the feelings in their hallways, but spread it out into their communities. It's very important that adults realize that kids are watching every move they make and that's where they're learning this. Do you have help with all of this, Kirk? I actually do now, Bob. When we first started out, I, I was pretty much doing it on my own, me and wow. Lord by ourselves. And we struggled mightily for a long time, seven, eight years. Most of this was funded out of our own pockets. We actually closed our savings and our retirement accounts to continue saving babies. I get messages from literally thousands of kids that say, you saved my life. I was going to kill myself until I heard what you had to say. One out of four of our children in America right now have a plan on how they would take their own life before they graduate from high school. 25% of our kids in our country would have a plan on how they would take their own life. I can't live in a world like that. Has this been getting worse in recent years? It really, truly has. Like I say, cyberbullying's increased 75% since the pandemic. We are making great strides and great inroads in physical and in-person bullying. It's a battle to stop cyberbullying. It's so difficult. There are so many different ways that kids can harm each other online and getting them to realize the, the implications, the ramifications that cyberbullying can cause. They think, oh, I was just kidding. I was just joking. But you know what? Bullying is in the eye of the victim. We got to take that power away from the bully. If the bully says, I was just kidding, I was just joking, but the kid that he bullied took it serious, and that child was bullied, and you are a bully. When we come back from this break, Kirk will talk about the impact of um, bullying 
uh, in, in politics and the impact that that can have with our kids. So stay with us. We know that adults bully adults, right? We know that politicians bully other politicians, and they bully reporters, too. The recent firings at Fox News demonstrate a lot of that. My question is whether you believe the political situation in recent years has contributed to the increase in bullying in schools and in workplaces and in our daily lives. Do you feel that? I do. And again, it goes back to kids watching adults and learning from that behavior. You mentioned politicians bullying each other and politicians bullying reporters. And bullying happens in our workplaces as well. Bullying happens in our homes, like we talked about earlier. Bullying is very prevalent. It happens in our professional sports. I'm a baseball fan. St. Louis Cardinals are my team. Me and Ty and Laura always went to the St. Louis Cardinals baseball game at Bush Stadium for Ty's birthday every year. He loved the Cardinals. He always said he had two favorite baseball teams, the St. Louis Cardinals and anybody that was beating the Yankees. I say that about the Baltimore Orioles, and I have yeah. to tell you, Kurt. I don't know. I'm all for the second half of that, but uh, I got to say, the time I first beat the Cardinals in the 68 World Series, I just want to say, I got to see the Orioles beat the Cardinals in the spring training game. I had a man reach out to me, and I don't know if you guys know who he is. His name was Billy Bean. Yeah, I, I do. Bill, I do. Billy Bean. You was played for the, the first. Yeah, and he was one of the first major league ball players that came out as gay. Right. And he was hired by the commissioner of baseball to be an inclusive person to go around and talk to all of the players and stuff about being inclusive. And he and I have communicated over the past via email and, and had several conversations. And I told him, I said, Billy, here's what I'd like to see. I said, I grew up playing little league baseball. I've been a fan of Major League Baseball all my life. I had a, an uncle that actually played for the St. Louis Cardinals farm team way back in the 30s or 40s. I've got a picture of him in the old baseball uniform. And I said, I coached Little League Baseball until Ty passed. And one thing I see when kids are playing youth baseball, after the ball game, what does every team do? They walk yes. across the field and they shake hands and they say, good game, or they high five and they say, good game. And I said, after every major league ball game, what do they do? And he's, well, the players high five each other, their own teammates. They run out and they say, great, great job, good game. I would like to see major league baseball and all the other sports one game a year. That's all I'm asking. One game a year. Meet out in the middle of that field, in that infield, shake your opponent's hand after the game and say, you did a great job, good game, high five, and let our kids see you do that because they're watching you. You're their heroes, man, and they're learning from that. And when they see professional athletes bullying each other, they see it on them doing it online, they see them doing it on social media, they see them doing it on the field, they see bullying in our workplaces, in our homes, from our politicians, they're soaking all that in, and they think that's acceptable behavior, and it's not. It can literally kill someone. It took my kid, my baby passed away 4,790 days ago, and I have missed him every second every day. And it's devastating. Burke, did you quit your job in order to do all this work that you're doing to try to stop bullying in honor of your son? For the first few years, I had a, a wonderful boss that I worked for. I was a construction worker. I did sheet metal work. I was a member of a, a sheet metal local union out of Oklahoma City. And my boss was amazing. He let me go anytime I needed 
to go and speak to kids in schools because he knew that what I was doing was saving babies and saving lives. And he said, you go do what you need to do. You save babies. And then it got to the point where I was traveling. I was on the road literally 300 days a year. And obviously you can't hold a full-time job. And I got to where I, I, I couldn't do it. And so, yeah, I, I quit my job and I threw myself into doing what I do, trying to save kids. Well, are you raising money? You, are you getting financial assistance? We get donations on our website. We, we apply. Laura, before she passed, she took a course on grant writing and she applied for several grants and stuff. And we got grants to help us continue our work. Majority of our funding comes from from people, just individuals that want to donate and help us. You know, we have a, a donate button on our website, and a lot of people will sign up for a monthly donation. Some of them might be $10 a month. Some of them might be a dollar a month. But you know what? Every dollar that we receive helps me buy a wristband for a kid that says, I am somebody. These glow in the dark so kids can read them at night. It helps me buy the pledge cards that we give to the kids by the thousands. And we give every one of the kids we talk to one of these wristbands and one of these pledge cards, and it helps me travel to schools that invite me to speak. I actually have fundraising teams now. The last couple of years, I decided I realized that I can't continue to do what I do without help. And so I put fundraising teams out in 19 different states, and they've been doing phenomenal work for me. They raise money to, and not only that, they raise awareness, which is so important. They have gotten me invited to so many schools. When the pandemic began, we got shut down on being able to do presentations in person in schools. They didn't want all the kids in an auditorium or a gymnasium together because of COVID. And so we did a lot more online presentations for schools, Zoom presentations. Since the pandemic has ended, and schools are pretty much back to normal. We're back to traveling about 300 plus days a year. We average about 300 days a year on the road. Speaking, I got to where I quit flying because I have really bad luck with airlines. Cancel my flights. They delay my flights. They lose my luggage, which has all of my wristbands and presentation supplies and all the resources that I leave at schools. So I pretty much drive everywhere. I just got home recently from driving 22 hours to go to a school in Naples, Florida from Oklahoma. And then I did a presentation there and turned around and drove 22 hours back. At the end of the month, I head to Utah. That's about a 21 hour drive for me. Hey, Kirk, I recently wrote a book about bullying uh, called Happy Jack, Sad Jack, a bullying story. It's a story in rhyme. It's a children's picture book for kids from kindergarten to perhaps fourth grade. Jack is a biracial child who would bully because he's different, for lack of a better way to say it, than the white kids at school. I have a couple questions about that. How much of bullying that you encounter is based on racial issues, one, and two, does bullying occur at such as a young age? Uh, this child in the book, was bullied in kindergarten. And I was looking for a, a way to introduce the issue to kids before it becomes an issue. Is that a thing? Do kids get bullied at that young an age? Is this book appropriate to teach bullying? It is. Sadly and unfortunately, Mark, bullying happens. I speak normally to kids from about fourth grade on up because our message is pretty powerful. We not only talk about bullying, we talk about youth suicide. And we try to get the older kids in the communities to spread our message down to the little bitty ones. But yes, bullying does occur as young as, as preschool and kindergarten. I'm actually speaking Monday morning or Monday afternoon at a school in Fort Worth, Texas to kindergarten through eighth grade. You now, bullying happens on all age levels, sadly. The book you wrote, I literally love it. We have tons of children's books on our website. And we're uh, we're going to get yours with your approval on there soon because those are 
very important resources for our kids and for our parents and for our schools and communities and our libraries. And, you know, what I do when some of the resources that I leave at every school I go to, I leave them some of those children's books. I speak at middle schools and high schools, elementary schools, colleges, open to the public community presentations, and I leave children's books with every single one of those because our local college kids and our local high school kids, they're the local heroes. The little kids look up to them. They want to be like them. They want to dress the way they dress. If you start wearing Nike tennis shoes in high school, all your elementary kids are going to have them on in a week. They want to say the things they say. They want to act the way they act. And I get those local high school or college kids or middle school kids to take those children's books down to their elementary schools in their community and read the stories to them and then have a talk with them about it. Impact of that is twofold. First of all, it keeps the older kids involved, makes them feel like, hey, I'm making a difference. I'm being somebody's hero. I'm teaching somebody something. And it spreads our message down to the little ones. And they learn from somebody that they respect, somebody that they look up to, someone that they want to emulate and be like, and they realize, I don't have to be this way. What about the other part of my question, the racial and religious issues? What would you say the percentage of bullying is based on that? Bullying happens for just about every reason that you can think of. There is a lot of racial bullying going on in our schools and in our communities and even in our homes. And there are are a lot of religious bullying. That is something that, that we as an organization do not really get involved in is religion. I myself am a religious man. I believe that there's something after this. I have to believe that, Mark, because someday I want to hold my wife and I want to hold my baby again. And I have to be the best man I can while I'm on this earth so that I can see them again. And i got to believe that there's something in the hereafter. I wish that for you, man. But we as an organization do not get involved in politics. And we don't get involved in religion because those are too inflammatory. If I say I'm a Republican and a conservative, then I've lost half my audience. But that's for sure. I've lost half of the people that want to hear my message. If I say that I'm Baptist or Christian or Buddhist or atheist or whatever, then I've lost a portion of my audience. We want to be all inclusive so that everyone hears the message that, you know what? We don't have to be this way. We can change this world. But it's going to take all of us fighting for these kids. Look, right. Anybody else have anything to add? I understand that uh, the tap for the silent can help ordinary citizens like Bob and I in South Carolina or in Michigan or anywhere else host a presentation in their own neighborhood. How, how do we get that? How does that get done? If you go to our website, there's a drop down on the menu and What's the, what, when's the website, by the way, stand for the silent dot? It's www.standforthesilent.org. Okay. And if you go to there, the homepage, there's a drop down on the main homepage and there's a menu. And if you can go to four schools, you'll see a place where it says host a presentation and you click on that and it has a form you fill out who you are, what your role is at the school. I get a lot of parents that say, I want you to come and talk to my kid's school. They really need this. Unfortunately, I can't just call a school and say, hey, I'm going to be there Tuesday. Have all your kids at 9 a.m. at the gymnasium. It doesn't work that way. You have to get someone at the school that will schedule a presentation with me. So talk to your principal, your assistant principal, a counselor, a teacher, someone that you one of your contacts at the school and get them to invite us, and we will come free of charge. We'll put you in touch with our schedule coordinator, and we'll make it happen. It's that simple. I've been on your website. It also talks about, quote, starting a a chapter. How does somebody start a chapter? That's real easy, too. We've made it easy so that basically anyone can do it. 
we like to see chapters get started in not only schools, but in communities. There's two different types of chapters, and you start either one of them both the same way. Again, you go to our website, you click on that four schools tab, and if you scroll down, you'll see that's how to start a chapter or start a chapter. And you click on it, you scroll down a little bit, and there's going to be, I think it's a little blue button that you click on that says download start a chapter packet. It's going to look similar to this right here. It has a information step-by-step -step how the parents can start a chapter in their community, how a school can start a chapter in their school, it has the original constitution that was written by children, an example of what we would need sent to us from the chapter. They hold a meeting. They, they vote for their officers. They create a name and a mission statement for their chapter. And then once we approve it, we send them an official letter that says your chapter was approved on such and such date. We put them in touch with our national chapter liaisons and they go to work. Has that been a successful campaign? Have you started a lot of new chapters? It actually has. Our chapter list seems to hover around 400 for some reason. Part of the reason is when I go to a school and speak, they get all excited, they get fired up and they want to keep this going and they start their chapter in say a high school and they continue it for three or four years. And then those kids all graduate and they leave and it dies off a little bit. I have some schools that I go to every or communities that I go to their schools almost every single year. I've got one in Aurora, Illinois. And they have four middle schools in their, their community. And every year they bring me in to speak to all four of their seventh grade classes. And their chapters in their schools seem to be more long, have more longevity to them because they, the kids are continually getting fresh blood into that chapter. They have heard my message and seen what we do and why we do what we do. I have a lot of community chapters that that want to get the message out into their community and help support their community's kids. And they help get us into their local schools and raise awareness in their communities and stuff like that. Some of the things I've seen my school chapters do, I have a chapter in Brownstown, Illinois. Their basketball team got a bunch of our wristbands, got a bunch of our pledge cards, got a bunch of our brochures that tell about who we are and what we do. And during every single one of their home games, they went out at halftime. They read our pledge out loud and had the crowd repeat it with them. Wow. And then after they did that, they walked across the court. They gave each one of their opponents one of our wristbands, one of our pledge cards, and they hand a brochure to the coat of that opposing team. When they did that, That's within a month, I got invited to 12 schools in that area because of those kids spreading our message that way. Those are some of the things our chapter kids do. They're just, they're amazing. They do floats in their homecoming parade and their town's Christmas parade. They do fundraisers for their chapter. Money stays with them. I had one of our chapters that bought out a bunch of prom dresses from a business in their community that was going to out of business, and they donated those prom dresses to local school kids that couldn't afford to buy a prom dress to go to prom. Those type of things. That's amazing stuff. That uh, last question: Tell the people about Rory and Roxy. Who are they? And by the way, what did they think of Happy Check? Oh, Rory and Roxy are two young girls that are just amazing. I can't say enough good about these two two babies. They're being homeschooled. Their parents don't want them to go to public schools. They're afraid of the bullying and what's going on in our public schools nowadays. And they are just smart as whips. These two young ladies are just so intelligent. And they live not too far from me. I live out in the middle of nowhere, Oklahoma, out in the country. And they live down the, the dirt road from me. And every time we get a new children's book, I have them do a review of it. They read the story. They usually read it with their, their grandpa. And then they have a discussion about it. And 
their grandfather and a lady that works for Stand for the Silent helped them write their review for that book. And you can find those on our website as well. The Rory and Roxy reviews are outstanding. They learn so much from these children's books and how to treat each other, how to treat others, and how to respect yourself and that type of thing. And they're just amazing young ladies. And they've done a review on your bookmark. And I think you got a copy of it sent to you, didn't you? I did. Okay. I did. I have to tell you that I've gotten a lot of reviews in my days for a lot of my books, and I'm the most honored about that one. All right. Kirk, I'll tell you what, it's a real pleasure to speak with you and to learn about the work that you're doing with Stand for the Silent. And you guys, if if you could chip in and help out, go on the Stand for the Silent website. To do what you can. Contribute if you can. Start a chapter if you can. This is a really important undertaking. Kirk has devoted his life in honor of his son to this, and uh, and I'd recommend. I hope that we can all support this initiative. Standforthesilent.org. Standforthesilent.org. Now just stay with us again for a quick uh, break. And right after that, I'll have some closing comments. So guys, thanks so much for listening. If you haven't done so already, check out Mark Bellows, Rip from the Headlines, Legal Thrillers. They're all available online at Amazon and other major online booksellers. He has quite the hero in attorney Zachary Blake, who fights for justice on all fronts. His books are Betrayal of Faith, Betrayal of Justice, Betrayal in Blue, Betrayal in Black, Betrayal High, Supreme Betrayal, Betrayal at the Border, You Have the Right to Remain Silent, and his latest, The Final Steps of Harbor Springs Cozy Legal Mystery. Now, he's also written the children's book that we've been talking about this afternoon, Happy Jack, Sad Jack. It's a wonderful story and a wonderful book, and I recommend you check it out. For more information, just go to markmbello.com. Until next time, this is Bob Gaddy for Mark Bello, signing off from Justice Commons.